You good? Okay. All right. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. All right, my friends. We are moving into chapters 5 and 6 of Hosea. Um, and it's entitled, A Call to Repentance. That's not the only thought, obviously, in these chapters, but it is a dominant thought of God, once again, pleading with His people to come out and, and recommit themselves to Him and Him alone, because He's not in the business of sharing His people's affection with these other gods. He's a jealous God, as it starts out in Hosea. So He's, he's, not, he's not content to let His people play both sides of the fence, as these people were. We're trying to do. So we're going to look at that. Uh, there's some really good points in these two chapters. And I am asked uh, Brother Ross if he would to lead us in a word of prayer. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> okay, so I thought this might be a, a better way to approach each chapter by pointing out some of the highlights that I see that I would like for us to look at together. And obviously, trying to cover two chapters, you don't, you know, we we can't we can't get overboard on any one point. But I think it is good and helpful to at least. Uh, try and, and address some of the dominant thoughts in each chapter. And the first one I want us to see is how God was viewing his people with the act of harlotry. And that's important to know because that term, harlotry, when it's applied to a people figuratively, which is done many times over through the prophets, it's only applied to God's people. He never applies it, at least I don't know of any case, where he applies it to other nations because he's not in a relationship with them. He's in a relationship with his people and they're the ones who are being unfaithful. And that's, I think, relevant going even through the New Testament. So we'll look at that. Uh, he points out how Judah is stumbling because remember, Hosea is going to the northern kingdom of Israel and he points out how Judah is stumbling with Israel how Israel had pagan children is the phrase used in verse 7 and how God was requiring them to make confession of their sins. And looking at this first point, he starts out in verse 1, Hear this, O priest, take heed, O house of Israel, give ear, O house of the king, for yours is the judgment, because you have been a snare to Mizpah and a snare, a net spread on Tabor. The revolters are deeply involved in slaughter, though I rebuke them all. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you commit harlotry. Israel is defiled. Now, I do think it's worth noting that he starts out this chapter by pointing out the priests and the kings, or at least the house of the king. And he's simply addressing the spiritual and civil leaders of the people. And he's saying, this has a lot to do with you, is what he's saying. This is your judgment. Because you're just like Mizpah and Tabor. Now, from what I read, these are the either side of the Jordan, wooded areas, okay? You have the Mizpah on one side, Tabor on the other. And the, I think the pictures he's making is they've, tra they've just trapped in the people of God. Okay, the priests and the king, by them being so wicked, they've trapped in the people of God Okay, with their influence and with their example. And so he is, he's pointing this out once more that 
They were having an effect on his people as a whole. But his people as a whole were still at fault. You know, the revolters are deeply involved in slaughter, though I rebuke them all. And he says, Ephraim, you're not hidden from me, in verse 3. Israel's not hidden from me. So he is letting them know that he was very well aware of their spiritual condition. Can you think of any other verses in the Bible that show that we're not hidden from God? That there's no way we can hide from God? Can you think of any passages where God wants us to know this in our relationship with him? Okay, yeah, Adam and Eve tried to hide. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good, good account. <clears throat> Any, anything else? Right, yes, he tried to run from the presence of the Lord. Jonah did, right. Okay, Hebrews 4.13. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good. That's a good reference there. That all we're all naked before the Lord and open before the one whom we have to give an account to is what that verse is showing. Yeah, Hebrews four thirteen. That's a good one. Say it again, please. Elijah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Help me out. What are you talking about? Okay. I don't know, brother. It's been a while since I've read. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And he, he did. He did feel sorry for himself, certainly. Um, but you get the point, right? I mean, you understand. Just like he told his people here, you can't. Hi I see you. Okay. Now we think if we get him out of our mind, then <laughs> we're out of his sight, and that's. That doesn't work out that way, you know. Like me, if I play hide and seek with somebody, you know, a big old boy like me, I need more than just a little tree to hide behind. Because I think if I'm hiding behind a tree and I don't see you, then you don't see all this big stuff sticking out. But that, that's not the case. God, God sees us. He knows everything about us. And there's nowhere we can go where we are hidden from him, okay? All right, so they needed to see that. And they needed to know, you are committing harlotry. Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the phrase Ephraim, that term used for Israel. And Hosea really hammers this phrase with Israel. And I, I try to understand why. Why is Israel called Ephraim so much? And we can see that it most likely goes back to the very first king they had as an independent nation was Jeroboam, and he was from Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim. And the very first capital he set up was at Shechem in the hills of Ephraim in 1 Kings 12, 25. Well, what will throw you off is that most maps have Shechem in Manasseh, just above Ephraim. And so that's what kind of throws you off when you look into this, as even this map will show but originally, Shechem was in Ephraim, according to the Bible. And so that was the first capital. It didn't remain the only capital of, capital of Israel. You had two others, Tizra, and then um, Samaria was the final capital of the kingdom of Israel. And that's the one that was in, in force, in play, when Hosea came on the scene, the city of Samaria. That's what we see in 2 Kings 14, Omri was the first one to, to move it there. All right, but still, the thing is, even though the capital was removed later on by the time of Hosea, uh, he still refers to Israel as Ephraim. And it's because they were the most influential tribe among the ten, okay? They were the chief tribe and of the ten. And then, of course, in Judah, you had the tribe of Judah as the predominant tribe. Um, so it, it, anyway, it still had that status, the tribe itself, and it represented the entire nation of Israel. 
Uh, one source says the territory of Ephraim contained the early centers of Israelite religion, Shechem and Shiloh. These factors contributed to making Ephraim the most dominant of the tribes in the kingdom of Israel and led to Ephraim becoming a synonym for the entire kingdom. Okay? So that, that kind of makes sense. I can see that. One way or another, that's how these people are defined as Ephraim. And once again, he calls them out for their harlotry. Verse 3 you commit harlotry. And I went through, and you can look at the term harlot <clears throat> or harlotry, and you can see how it's used quite a bit in the prophets. Okay, Ezekiel has it referenced 35 times in his writing. But they use this word a lot to describe the people of God, both of Israel and then of Judah even. And like I said, um, they applied this term exclusively to God's people because that's the people he had, a, he had a relationship with, a covenant relationship with. But they were being unfaithful. Okay? All right, so anything on those first few verses? Okay. The other point I wanted to make from chapter 5 is how Judah is stumbling with Israel. Uh, verse 4, chapter 5, they do not direct their deeds toward turning to their God for the spirit of harlotry is in their midst and they do not know the Lord. Okay? So once again, that's the big crime here is they don't know the Lord. Now they knew of the Lord, obviously. So what does he mean they don't know the Lord? In verse 4, Israel didn't. Right, they don't have the relationship with him. Right, exactly. Exactly. So how do you have that then? How do you know the Lord even today? You know his word? Good. You obey that word? Right? That's, that is all correct. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Right, 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 right. They were refusing to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. They were trying to split their affection between God and these other gods. So, right. And as a result, they did not know God halfway. That's not the way he viewed it. He viewed it as treachery, as uh, complete unfaithfulness. And, you, and you're, you, you and I are the same way. I mean, if our spouse is <laughs> only faithful to us just a little bit, it's, it's not like, well... At least they're faithful most of the time. You know, we're not good with that. Uh, it's, it's either for or against. You know, we, un we understand that concept. And God was the same way. And they could not know him as long as they were trying to, to straddle the fence. You see? And so he lets them know that. And he says that the pride of Israel testifies to his face. Therefore, Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah also stumbles with them. So, they are on the same path. Now, they weren't at the same level at this point as Israel was in full-blown departure, but they had their moments, okay? And it was only a matter of time before they did get into this shape. Now, we understand, we even pointed this out last week, that the independent nation of Israel went into captivity in 722 to Assyrian captivity. And then Judah lasted, you know, over 100 years after that before they went into captivity. And, it, of course, it happened in stages, 605, so on and so forth. Um, but they eventually went as well. And I'm looking at this, and I think, well, one of the main reasons why theirs didn't happen on the same, at the same time as, as Israel is because they, they had godly kings sprinkled throughout their history, okay, they all had the same starting date. Judah and Israel, the kingdoms did, when um, Solomon died. And the, you know, the division from Rehoboam. But if you look at even this chart that of those 19 rulers, eight of them sought the Lord. Okay, They did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And I think that prolonged 
this nation, you know, from not receiving the judgment at the same time as Israel did, because they didn't have they didn't have any in Israel. They all were departing from God's will. But when you look at Hosea, uh, he, he even points out that he did his work in Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. And, of course, he's writing at this time. And you have this one king here in the midst of those kings who was very wicked, Ahaz. And he reigned, um, what is that, 12 years, I think, what house? Oh, what was it? Where are we at? Um, let's see, six, about 16, somewhere in there, 16 years. Uh, but um, notice this. I thought this was kind of interesting. When you go back to 2 Kings 16, Ahaz in verse 2 was 20 years old when he became king. And it goes on to say, he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God as his father David had done, but he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Indeed, he made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. You see? So you had this little, this little pocket of time from the work of Hosea where you had one king in Judah just really go off the tracks, you see. And I kind of wonder if that's what he's getting at in Hosea chapter 5. Judah's stumbling just, just like him. Judah's doing the same thing. You know, and that could certainly be said of Ahaz's reign, okay? Walking just like the kings of Israel. Anyway, that was there for them to learn from. You see, they, they were given this insight because God wanted them to learn from their sister nation. Don't take the same path because it leads to judgment. How can we do that today? How, you know, what has God set up for us to learn from, to not make the same mistakes? What do you think about that? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. God has no grandchildren. That's a good, I've never heard that. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. That you can't serve God by proxy, you know, through your parents. You, you have to have that individual faith as well. But yeah, the, these are here to, uh, for us to learn from, these examples. Go ahead, Donna. Did you? Very good. Okay. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, yeah, so the old... Old law is a schoolmaster, is what uh, Galatians says, and that's true. You know, it, it kind of it helps us to better understand all of God's will. Did I see a hand back there? Oh yes, John. Yeah. Right. Hundred percent. Exactly. These were God's chosen people at the time, just like Christians are today. And it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same struggle. And it's the same message of walking by faith in God and His will and keeping Him first and not getting distracted by the influences of the world around us. Very timeless lesson. Which kind of makes me wonder why we have the prophets, you know, recorded for us to learn from. Go ahead. Those who are ignorant of history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Um, so that's why it's important for us to have Bible classes, you know, for all ages and to read the Word of God 
on a regular basis and to live by the Word of God uh, because it keeps His will alive. Uh, one of the points that He made of His people at this time is their children were heathens. You have pagan children is what He says in verse 7. They've dealt treacherously with the Lord, for they have begotten pagan children. Well, how do you begot pagan children? It's the DNA, right? <laughs> they just got hold of some, you know, bad chromosomes. And so, uh, oops, here comes the demons. How do you have pagan children? Say that, huh? There you go. Having relations with pagans, and you know, in terms of the... The influence, the spiritual influence there. Did I hear someone else over here? Okay. So when he says pagan children, what's he saying? Say what now? Say it again, please. Alien children? Unknown, okay. Alien, unknown. Um... Strange, yeah. Well, that still happens today, right? Strange children coming out. But, uh, but yeah, we think, I think we can see what he's talking about here. He's talking about in relation to him. You know, they're alien or they're strange. Or in relation to his will, these people weren't producing godly children. Not because of some DNA issue, right? But it's the home, right? The home wasn't emphasizing the will of God. Go ahead, brother. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Going back to his the harlotry. You see, and in verse six he talks about how um, they're trying to play both sides. You know, with their flocks and herds they seek they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. Well, the only reason he's done that is because they're trying to practice idolatry and serve God at the same time. That's when he's, God's not going to do that. I mean, if we turn away from hearing his will, what does he say about our worship? Our prayers are even a what to him? You know, abomination, very good. Our prayers are even an abomination to the Lord when we discontinue hearing his will or his law or his word. The eyes of the Lord on the righteous, but his prayers are... are his, I'm sorry. What is that? First Peter 3 and verse 12. Um, it talks about how he hears those who seek him. Uh, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Well, any, you know, we, we're all going to struggle with sin. We know that. But he's not talking about that here. He's talking about somebody who's wanting to live in sin and get religious on the side with God. And he's, God says, I, I'm, I have no part of this. He's withdrawn himself from that. Did I see a hand back there and then one over here? Go ahead, Gene. Gene. Okay, good. They were separated uh, from God because of sin, just like we will today. So that's a, that's a fair point. That's true. At the heart of hearts, because he knows what's there, he has to see somebody who loves him, believes in him, trusts him, is striving to keep him first, and is not trying to play both sides of the fence. Go ahead over here, could you? Uh, oh. That's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Going back to the law. God warned them before you gave and get into the land. Don't try and co-mingle and keep these uh, structures in place or the people in place because, um, you know, filth, filth rubs off a whole lot easier than the good stuff. So <laughs> that's just the way it is. Did you, did you have a hand over here? Oh, good. Yeah. 
right? Yeah, Laodicea, yeah. He was going to spew them out of his mouth because they were lukewarm. You know, they weren't totally committed to the Lord. So that's a good reference. Jim? Right. I know this, and they follow me. Mm -hmm. And that's a big connection. Right. They know me from the scriptures, from the scriptures. That's how we know God, because He knows us. True. We follow those uh, commands and, and that He gives us. Mm -hmm. And we, yeah. we willingly do that. Right. That's true. We follow Him. Yeah, because uh, we're not being coerced into this. Uh, we follow him because of our faith in him and, and love for him, devotion to him. And so God's showing us even through these people how he is looking for a peculiar people. Okay, He wants his own special people. And he will not share us with the world. We struggle with sin, absolutely. But we don't remain in sin. And it's always been the case with God and his people. Well, these people were, were, they were wanting to stay in it. And when God told them to get out of it, well, then they kept looking for somebody who said they could stay in it. Okay? And this wasn't going to drive well with God. And so he was wanting them to repent. Okay? He says in verse 14, I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them away and no one shall rescue. You see, God's, God's reminding them. He's going to hold them accountable and there's not a person in the world who can stop me from judging you for your unfaithfulness. Go ahead. Uh, we are flesh and we sin. Right. No, no doubt about it. Yep. Mm -hmm. The big joke. He said, the good news is, I can be forgiven. Mm -hmm. God can see right through that. God is expecting uh, a high return uh -huh. from his people. He expects in us to contend earnestly mm -hmm. for the faith once delivered to the saints. He's expecting us to get better and better and better mm -hmm. over that, time. Right. Not Right. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. But more than that, we are Christians. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be like Jesus. Yeah. More and more every day. Right. Exactly. Because it, it is a maturity. It is a growth process in our relationship with God. And, and even the reference there to Laodicea, you know, of, of thinking that we can somehow be lukewarm in our relationship with God and it be okay with Him. Uh, he always wants us to come out of the world and be separate. You know, even in verse 15, I will return again to my people till they acknowledge their offense. See, God was ready to forgive, but he wanted them to come clean, you know, and admit that they, they were the ones who did wrong and not any other cause for that. And then they will seek my face in their affliction. They will earnestly seek me. You see, so that's how it is today. Are you going to let's let's just say you have another year left on earth. Are you going to sin? Yeah, I, I imagine we are going to struggle with sin. Is it our intention? Are we going to you know, remain in our sin? No, we don't remain in it. What does God tell us when we do sin and as his people? To repent, Right. Confess and pray for forgiveness. And he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us. We just have to trust him that he will. But in no sense of the word should we ever say, well, God, I tried to get out of this stuff. I can't do it. You're just going to have to adjust to this. This is just who I am. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's what he's saying to these people. It's not going to work. It's not going to And he heard the cry. He cleansed it. They right. made Pharaoh 
bear more fruit. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yes, that's true. He, he wants us to continue to grow and bear more fruit. And he's looking for that. All right, so those are some of the highlights from chapter 5. Uh, in chapter 6, these are some highlights, I think, uh, that are worth noting. How he's pleading with them to return to the Lord. Um, he compares their faithfulness to like a cloud. That's an interesting thought. That phrase, I desire mercy and not sacrifice... It's right here in Hosea, which Jesus used himself. And he goes back to pointing out how Israel is defiled and they have to be judged. But he says in verse 1, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us uh, know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. So when you read that, what, what comes to mind? Those, say that again. Okay, the parallel to Christ being raised on the third day. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good, good observation. Anything else come to, you know, anything else stand out? From those verses? Okay. The rain brings growth and life and the restoration. Yeah, I think that's the, the point, you know, is that he will forgive and bless. But what has to happen first? We have to return to him. You see, we have to seek him with all of our heart, verse 1. And then he will heal. And I need to remember that, okay? Okay. Uh, to serve God, love God from the heart. Okay, anything on those verses? All right, and then verse 4 says, uh, O Ephraim, uh, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew, it goes away. Now, I, when, I, when, when you read, O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? Does that remind you of anything? As far as in your relationships. I mean, what, what's he saying to these people? Fed up. All right. He's fed up with them. Yeah. <laughs> like a parent. You know, what am I going to do? All right. That, that's what it read, That's the way it reads to me. Yes, brother. True. Afterward. Yeah. Right. Well, none of us like like to be rebuked, right. chastened, yeah. or corrected. Uh, we just it just goes against the grain. Right. And that's why it's hard to confront these people. Yeah. Especially in society today. Yeah. Just punch in the mouth. Right. Even that's true. Sin, yeah. It, we just don't like that. If somebody tells us, tend to your business, I'll mind my business. Right. For those who have been trained by it, you know. Yeah. We just have to be servants of the Lord. Right. And yield ourselves and be humble. Right. Or you're not going to make it to heaven, I don't believe. Absolutely. Right. That's true. Without without that pursuit of peace and holiness, no one's going to see the Lord. We used to sing that song, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, you know, because that's kind of what that song's saying mold me and shape me after thine will, O Lord. You know, have your own way. Well, that needs to be our prayer. Is That's a very good reference there, the chastening of the Lord and the fruit that it brings. Oh, right. Yes. Hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Right. Okay, and that's, uh, that's it. I mean, because he did. He, he, he sent prophet after prophet to plead with these people to repent. Okay? And they wouldn't do it. But let me ask you, why wouldn't they do it? What, what, why were they hitting their head against the wall? What was the problem here? From what you've seen so far, what was the problem? Okay, well, say it again. Okay, I was, exactly. The bad leadership. You had the ungodly priest <laughs> telling them what they wanted to hear, and then you had the ungodly kings who were you know, leading them away from God. Okay, but he still held them accountable, right? Them as a nation. Okay. Hmm. Right. Okay. That's true. They, they were literally ignorant of God's word. Yeah. Right. Exactly. This is your God, O Israel. Yeah. So they were, they were ignorant of his word. Um, highly influenced by the spiritual leaders of that day, highly influenced by society. And it was just more than they were willing to give up. And, and it just wasn't going to work. He says, your faithfulness is like a morning cloud. What do, what do you think it means by that? Oh, go ahead, brother. Okay. Okay. Lot did, yeah. Right. Right, right. Right, we get as close as we can to the, the world. Right, and Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Your hand, chop it off. You know, you have to, you ha we have to be serious about keeping God at the center of our heart. Go ahead, brother. Did you? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Or my parents. Or like you said, you know, Graham. Right. <laughs> it won't. That's a good point. Yeah. So, you know, this idea of remaining faithful, okay? Just like the fog just lifts and moves away quickly uh, is what he's comparing their faithfulness to. You know, they come back um, just for a little bit. But, but like the early do, it just goes away, you see. But I, I, he doesn't want us to visit, right? God wants us to give him, give him everything, give him our heart, and totally commit ourselves. Can you think of what these people, if they would have just repented, like God was saying, you know, and really turned over to the Lord and said, okay, let's do it. We were wrong. We messed up. Let's do it. Imagine what he would have done for these people, his people. I mean, he spared Nineveh. Because Jonah went in and they listened and they repented. Well, what would he do for his people if they would have just listened to him? And yet the point is, he's doing that with us if we just listen. All right, so he does use this great phrase, um, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, in verse 6. Um, and the point Hosea is making is that God didn't want their stuff in worship. He didn't care about that. He wanted their heart. He wanted them to serve him from the heart. And we can certainly see that same principle today. Well, well, Jesus took this phrase on a different couple of different occasions in his ministry. When he was being criticized for eating with sinners, he brings up this reference to Hosea, where God wants mercy and not sacrifice. Now, real quickly, how, was he, how would that have been relevant to that scene? Jesus is being criticized by whom? There you go, the Pharisees, the religious leaders in the Jewish community. And Jesus responds by bringing up Hosea. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So what was Jesus saying by bringing up that verse? I mean, they were sacrificing, right? The Pharisees were sacrificing 
all kinds of things in their own regulations. But what was wrong? Jesus says that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, right? We can't be pleasing to God. Well, how in the world are you going to exceed theirs? All right? It was in their attitude. You can't do more externally than they did, but you can definitely do more internally than they did, you know, from the attitude, from the heart. Well, that's what he's saying here to these Pharisees, that God wants people to serve from the heart, love from the heart. And if you would do that, you would be joining me in pleading with these people to repent. But see, that, that was the lesson they needed to hear. Okay, anything else on that? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So that's here in Hosea chapter 6. And then he says in Hosea chapter 6 that Israel was defiled. Um, verse 7, like men, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt treacherously, treacherously with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers and defiled with blood. Well, to appreciate what he's saying, Gilead was one of those cities that God set up for the people to run to um, for refuge. You know, if they had killed somebody accidentally, they were to make it to these cities, and then it was hands off until, you know, they could have a proper day in court, so to speak. You remember that? The cities of refuge? Well, Gilead was one of those, okay? But here he's saying it wasn't a city of refuge. Now it was a sanctuary city for evil, that they were, they were coming to do evil, and all this criminal activity was being practice there and people weren't being held accountable because it was a sanctuary city if you will and they had corrupted they had abused the concept that God had set up for a city like that as bands of robbers lie and wait for a man so the company of priests murder on the way to Shechem so the leaders are all corrupt you know the murder they, the priests murder on the way to Shechem does that remind you of any story in the Bible What's that? Say what? I thought the same thing. The Good Samaritan. Yeah, it was the priest and the Levite who weren't showing the mercy that they should have. Uh, so Israel is defiled, as he says in verse 10. Harlotry of Ephraim, Israel is defiled. Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of my people. So again, he comes back and says, now Judah, you need to wake up, Okay. Because you see what I'm doing to these people, but you're next if you don't, if you don't change course, okay? But at the very least, I think we can see the reason God was judging these people is because they had defiled themselves. What, what comes to mind when something's defiled? Defiled. What's a good way of stating that? Spoiled. Is that what you said? Okay. All right. Spoiled. Rotten, it stinks. Right? No good. no good, yeah. You know, it's it's been corrupted. It's not it's not what God intended. It has uh, been tainted by the world. All right? And that's what they did to themselves. Okay? Friends, th th listen, this is the lesson through this is we've got to continually love God more than the world because this world is passing away, okay? All right, so anything else on these verses? Yes, sir. Okay, chapter 5. Pagan children, uh-huh. Right. 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 They knew nothing about God. Okay. Yeah. And the, the, the burden was on the parents, right, for not sharing that knowledge because they were so corrupt themselves. So, yeah, good point. Okay. Next week, Clint's going to cover uh, chapter 7 and 8, I believe. Is that right? Yes. So, chapter 7 and 8 next week. Thank you.